Okay, so this is a landing video. I'm gonna go ahead and pour. Just, I'm just gonna cover the mixture up with vinegar. And it is reacting and bubbling, fizzing. And it's kind of a goopy, bubbly, blackish, liquidy mixture. Okay, for part two, I'm gonna use, I'm gonna start out with a magnet. Uh, and I'm kind of like, I'm gonna kind of like squeeze the plastic wrap so it forms a tight seal or covering over the magnet itself. And then I'm just gonna like move the magnet over the mystery substance, kind of like this. And bam, a whole bunch of stuff is collected onto the magnet. And then I'm just gonna use my finger to rub it off. So I'm gonna keep doing this until no more stuff is magnetically attracted to the magnet. Theoretically, this is our first pure mystery substance. Again, I'm gonna hypothesize that it's iron. Okay, so the second thing to try, as we had uh, discussed, is to pour water into the remaining mixture, remaining two substances in the mixture and give it a good mix. Okay, so I've mixed this for a good while. Now I'm gonna pour this nice looking liquid into my filter. Okay. So something is catching on the filter paper and liquid is dripping through. And we'll let that go for a while. And here is the final result. We have iron, baking soda solution, and sand. For a concluding idea, I'd like to discuss the transition from alchemy to chemistry. So what ideas or beliefs started to fall apart in alchemy, which gave way to chemistry. Well, alchemists like chemists today eventually realized that the key to finding consistent and predictable patterns in how matter interacts was to work with pure substances and not mixtures of substances. Why? Because samples of pure substances are perfectly uniform and have a consistent set of properties. So if I have a pure substance, it has a melting point, it has a freezing point, it has a density, it has like an electrical conductivity. And these properties which define that pure substance don't change. However, a mixture, on the other hand, has different properties depending on how much of each pure substance is mixed into it. Alchemists never abandoned the idea that matter is made up of different ratios of the four classical elements. And they would say you should be able to change any pure substance by decreasing or increasing the relative amounts of the four classical elements. Pure lead, therefore, pure abundant cheap lead, therefore, should be just a few tweaks away in the ratios from gold if only the right procedure can be found. But they failed. Alchemists never managed to figure out a chemical recipe to rearrange the four classical elements and create gold from lead. Something was evidently wrong with the alchemist belief system. The story begins to fall apart even more in the 1700s when scientists began discovering and identifying a set of pure substances that appeared to be the basic building blocks that made up, of, that made up all other pure substance. So in effect, they were more pure or more fundamental than the four classical elements. And worse, there were more than four. So materials like iron, yellow sulfur, uh, liquid mercury, soft lead, sparkling diamond could not be broken down any further. Then the story gets even worse for alchemy. Chemists like Antoine Lavoisier and Joseph Priestley, they came on the scene and observed that any reaction with these new elementary substances would add mass to them, meaning they were combining with something else. To change something like lead, you had to add something to it. You couldn't just simply change the makeup of lead itself where the mass would stay the same. Then in 1801, John Dalton proposed this new powerful theory called the theory of atoms and elements. And it was finally clear based on his work that it was impossible to turn lead into gold. Why? Because he determined that both lead 
and gold were fundamental pure elements themselves. Of course, this left a whole new set of questions, which is really the driving force behind this short course called The Chemical Elements. And these are, how can we find these elements? Where are they? Is there some relationship among the many new elements being discovered? And why do combinations of elements, so why when elements bond, do they have very different properties from the pure elements uh, that they bonded from? Before we dive fully in this, uh, into this course, it kind of makes sense to agree on a set of definitions. So let me just go through these real quickly. In fact, I'll, I'll skip sample and mixture. They're relatively straightforward. But compound and solution and element are important to talk about. So for compound, we know that all matter is made up of atoms and atoms can rearrange and bond to form new molecules. So when you have a sample of matter that is made up of entirely of one type of molecule, this is what a compound is. A solution. So this is a special type of mixture where one compound is very well mixed into another and appears uniform. So this happens often in liquids where table salt, for example, can dissolve in evenly into water. So that's a solution. When metals are melted together, they can also form a solution, and these are known as alloys. So dissolved molecules and solutions are not chemically bonded in the liquid. And finally, almost most importantly, is element. So what is an element? What's the definition of an element? A chemical element is a special type of sample, which is one type of atom. So the atoms can be bonded to each other, like diatomic oxygen, which always comes with two oxygen uh, atoms bonded together, or diatomic nitrogen or diatomic hydrogen, or they can be completely isolated atoms like helium, argon, or lead, which is PB. A final comment I can make in the deeper dive section on alchemy versus chemistry. It's not easy to mark a sharp transition where the study of matter moved from alchemy to chemistry. It wasn't like one day everybody was doing alchemy and the next day everybody was doing chemistry. And much of the work of alchemists has likely been ignored or de-emphasized by Western historians of science. Some Arabic alchemists like Jabir ibn Hayyan in the 9th century had developed sophisticated chemical experiments and methodologies and were beginning to extend the idea of the four element theory. They recognized way back then that the world was likely made up of the elemental materials we consider as elements today. And interestingly, interestingly more primitive forms of alchemy continued in, up until the 18th century in Europe. The famed physicist Sir Isaac Newton actually clung to the ideas of alchemy. He believed he could turn lead into gold until his dying day.